Hi, my name is Dane Newville. I'm one of the pharmacists here at MD Customer X Pharmacy. Thank you for joining our YouTube channel. And today's video is going to be on panexidyl ginsenoside, what that is, and how it can be beneficial for a lot of neuronal um, disease states and just overall brain health. Let's get into it. Panexidyl ginsenoside is actually a constituent of red ginseng. Uh, ginseng has been around for centuries, first founded uh, by ancient Chinese traditional medicine, um, but it's been revered for centuries for its numerous health benefits. Uh, we are discovering in, in the recent years more and more how it affects uh, cognitive function and an overall brain health, uh, which is really exciting. So we're going to get into that today, how exactly it's helping brain health and uh, how you could potentially obtain some of this panexidyl ginsenoside. So why panexidyl ginsenoside? Why the long name? What is this? How is it from ginseng? Well, it's actually just a steamed red ginseng byproduct, okay? It's a, a constituent. So um, certain plants, not all of them, but certain plants make, uh, like you could, I don't know if toxin's the right word, but they use, uh, they develop a defense mechanism that's a chemical to keep, like an in insecticide, to keep uh, insects and other predators away from them. Uh, a good example and a common food that we see in the United States, uh, usually during winter time in those um, colder climates is chili. People put red kidney beans in there. That's from the lectin class. Well, uh, that actually has a, a quote, quote unquote poisonous constituent in it. Um, believe it or not, eating four to five of those raw red kidney beans can cause severe gastrointestinal distress. So you're going to look at uh, like severe bloating, uh, maybe losing your bowels. Um, certainly not something you want, um, but interesting little correlation there is, you know, depending on how they're cooked and whose chili you're eating, if you're eating your own or whatnot, if you've had some gas, they're, they're, that could potentially be the culprit. But that's just kind of an idea of what plants are doing, and that's what the panexidyl ginsenoside is from the red ginseng. So when you steam it, you're able to distill that out, and um, of course, biochemists have taken quite an extensive look at uh, basically anything and any molecule there is and seeing if it, it can be helpful for the body or not. Um, again, intuitively, um, traditional Chinese medicine has used ginseng for um, enhancing endurance and cognitive ability, but it's been, you know, across a few years more recent, I could say decades even, that we've uh, been able to quantify that or measure that. That's the microbiologists and biochemists that are doing a lot of that work for us. So, Thanks to them. But let's get into um, how panexidyl ginsenoside is going to help with neurodegenerative disease states, okay? Like Alzheimer's, prions, multiple sclerosis, um, and some other ones. So panexidyl ginsenoside is kind of a tongue twister. So I may just call it RG3, and that's kind of how it's known in the healthcare community. So I'm going to call it RG3, uh, probably moving forward. So just know that if I say RG3 at all throughout this uh, video, it is that panexidyl ginsenoside, that steamed byproduct from red, from red ginseng. But in order to understand how it's, it's really helping with neurodegenerative disease states, we kind of want to know a little bit more about what causes that degeneration, neuronal degeneration, okay? A neurodegenerative disease state that has pro-inflammatory types of dynamics to it, pro-inflammatory meaning uh, inflammation-driven degeneration, and it's very well known as Alzheimer's disease, okay? And one of the key hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease in later stages are um, beta amyloid plaques, okay? Beta amyloid plaques is just a fancy name for essentially waste products that um, have become consolidated and your body no longer has the ability to actually pull them out of the brain. So obviously in the brain, uh, you have a filter called the blood-brain barrier right about here, uh, and only so many things can get through there. It's um, very limited, and rightfully so. Uh, even then, there's still waste products that the brain is producing that needs to be pulled out, and there's certain supportive cells that do that. Of course, you have your neurons, uh, which we all know have synapses, and that's like how you're thinking, your thoughts, just your awareness. It's, it's the activity part, that, that conscious part, and even subconscious. I don't want to get too deep there. Um, but 
neurons are kind of the staple of the brain that everybody thinks about. Although there are many other tissues, though other ones that we want to focus on for this video are the macroglial and the microglial cells. So specifically microglial cells are the cells that are going to help protect the neurons um, from harmful bacteria, fungi, viruses, and even help pull some of the waste products out. They're actually macrophages. A macrophage is a big cell uh, that's part of your immune system that can engulf other things, so it can just basically swallow up uh, waste products and, and, and bad guys, bacteria, fungi, and pull them out of the brain, and that's exactly what we want it for. But if the microglial cell, that macrophage, um, gets signaled too much and too often, the quote unquote garbage collector of the brain uh, can become the garbage because there's so much staff there. They, there's so many microglial cells sending in their messengers, which are cytokines, part of the inflammatory system, and uh, part of the immune system all coming into the brain um, that they are part of the problem too, okay? So that's how we get pro-inflammatory neurodegeneration but we'll get even more specific about it, so hang in there. Staying on track with the Alzheimer's disease and those beta amyloid plaques, or again, that garbage buildup I talked about in the head that your brain can't, or um, uh, certain parts of your body uh, you know, within the brain can't remove, again, those uh, microglial cells are unable to remove, uh, was the beta amyloid plaques, okay? But they start out as little peptides. They're called beta amyloid 42 peptides. Uh, microglial cells do recognize them and they signal in a bunch of inflammatory markers and other molecules to try, try, to, to, try to pull that waste product out. But with inflammation, there's certain other cell components that come in that um, can be devastating uh, to neurons. And that's what we want to keep healthy. Uh, for instance, um, microglial cells, when they see a beta amyloid 42 peptide, they're going to signal in those pro-inflammatory markers. Um, one of those is another signaling molecule, uh, but it's designed for um, apoptosis, uh, which is like the death and killing of a cell. Uh, it's called tumor necrosis factor, okay? And in specifically, tumor necrosis factor alpha is something that can be devastating to neurons. It's actually resistant to cancer, so in small doses, it works very well, but if it's overactive, uh, it's going to end up being devastating for the brain. So these beta amyloid 42 peptides are in the brain. The microglial cells are activated, okay? But there's other waste products too. So the microglial cells are being activated and signaled for so many other things in the brain too. Um, this is where Alzheimer's can become almost like a positive feedback loop, okay? The beta amyloid peptides are in the brain. They're starting to come around more. You also have all the other waste products that the microglial cells are trying to manage. They're calling in and recruiting all these inflammatory markers, but if it gets too crowded, they start attacking themselves. It's, you could think of it as an autoimmune disorder for the brain, okay? So how we can help with that is calm down the microglial cell signaling that at least can put a stick in the spokes of that positive feedback loop where we're getting more and more inflammation. Well, that panaxidylgen centocide or RG3 uh, in a few different studies has been shown actually to suppress um, one of the ways that microglial cells does its cell signaling, which is, is phenomenal. RG3 has the ability to prevent microglial cells from having a certain subunit down to the level of DNA that would normally code DNA to write certain proteins to come out and have certain expressions to lead to more cytokines, it prevents that on the level of DNA. So that's stopping the expression of cytokine signaling and having more cytokines come in. So it's, it's uh, shunting pro-inflammation from the micro glial aspect, which is the main culprit of inflammation in the brain for Alzheimer's disease and other neurodegenerative diseases. I mean, you can imply this on the prions disease and multiple sclerosis, okay? And to some extent, Parkinson's. Now, there's still a lot more studies coming out uh, and more research to be done about panexidylgen senocide or RG3. Um, but that was really uh, great to see. Uh, we now have proof of that in vivo. Uh, which is in the body, which is the most important one. Initially, it was done in vitro. Um, the RG3 also 
So circling back, if you recall, I just talked about uh, one of the cytokines, a cytokine being an inflammation molecule coming in to do its work. Um, tumor necrosis factor alpha, TNFA, is uh, kind of the biggest culprit for neurodegeneration and, and neuronal cell death. Okay. Um, RG3 had the ability to actually rescue some of those. So when the tumor necrosis factor alpha is in the midst of trying to create signaling to get apoptosis or that cell death, uh, that panexidyl, panexidyl <laughs> ginsenoside or RG3, I said I'd call it RG3, I should have stuck with that, uh, was able to prevent that from getting all the way through. So that's going to create more neuronal cell survival. A really interesting note, um, I've done some uh, research, obviously, um, on uh, nitric oxide. I have a seminar on nitric oxide. We've promoted nitric oxide because it does just numerous health benefits. Um, but on one of my videos, I speak specifically regarding about uh, induced nitric oxide synthase. Uh, that is a pathway that your body creates to create nitric oxide. And I talked about how many places... Uh, or I shouldn't say places, there's been a lot of studies that misview that, in my opinion, um, saying that the more the INOS, or induced nitric oxide synthase, is evident uh, surrounding any sort of cell death or degradation, um, it's because that the INOS is one of the culprits, and I argued the actual opposite, that nitric oxide is a survival mechanism, and therefore you're going to produce those pathways for... Um, to, to try to survive, right? Well, in uh, one of the studies that involved RG3 and the brain, they were talking about how um, RG3 was able to suppress the INOS pathways, which they thought was evidence towards its, its benefit towards um, protecting against uh, degeneration. And I thought that was interesting because I, I still, again, see it kind of the opposite. I don't see it uh, suppressing I uh, induced nitric oxide synthase pathways. I, I think it's that the panexidyl ginsenoside was working on those other factors, which were allowing the cells, um, the neurons, right, to, to not feel in jeopardy of not getting the molecules and nutrients they need to survive. Therefore, they didn't have to express those pathways. So um, if that sounds confusing, that's actually great. And uh, we'll have a link at the end of the this video, um, going to my nitric oxide seminar. If you want to fast forward to it, you'll get where uh, this will all make sense to you. Uh, if you find the cat analogy in that video, it's somewhere towards like the end of the first third of the video, or maybe in the middle of the video, but, uh, certainly I'll, I'll plead my case towards why, um, RG3 is extremely beneficial, um, but how they speak about, for instance, uh, nitric oxide synthase path pathways and uh, nitric oxide, uh, it shouldn't be considered harmful, but actually seen as uh, evidence towards something trying to survive. Another interesting feature of RG3 uh, was its ability, like we're talking about Alzheimer's disease and the beta amyloid 42 peptide prior to becoming a plaque. Um, it would be very important to remove that, right? Well, the RG3, it was actually able to enhance a part of the microglial cell um, receptors, okay? So cells are obviously very complex. They have different receptors and different receptor types, which can cause different functions to happen. But they were actually able to, the RG3 was actually able to enhance the removal of that beta amyloid 42 peptide. So what does that mean? It means that if someone has some level of progression heading towards neurodegeneration, heading towards like different later stages of neurodegeneration, right? That RG3 can slow that down. Um, who knows? I mean, we don't know yet, but maybe to some degree at some concentration can stop it, you know, pause it at least. Um, we do know that, like I said before, uh, the TNF, the tumor necrosis factor alpha that is causing neuronal death in like later stages when you have beta amyloid plaques built up and the, the cytokines, which is that TNFA, they're going crazy in the brain, uh, that RG3 was able to rescue some of those neurons, uh, meaning like while they're act actively being shut down, RG3 was able to pull them. Uh, and keep them alive. Uh, we know that uh, RG3 now, like I just said, can also pull out some of those peptides. So one, uh, plaques are building up. We have limited space in our brain. Uh, the pro-inflammation has a positive feedback loop. So everything's just catalyzed, accelerating, going faster and faster towards less and less neuron survival. Okay, uh, RG3 is going to pull out any new beta amyloid peptides. 
in Alzheimer's, right? So stopping other plaques from forming, but it's also going to rescue whatever neurons uh, are around that are still being attacked, as well as limiting the expression of any more um, cytokines and pro-inflammatory markers to come into the brain. Just really clearing that out. Um, now, this is not a cure-all. Um, this is not intended to treat as far as yet. But um, again, there is a lot of promising uh, stuff on penexidyl, ginsenoside, RG3. I just like saying it, I guess. It's fun. Uh, I have a few more tips, uh, or I shouldn't say tips, or educational points about it. Uh, I'll talk to you briefly about those. We're going to circle to a different part of the brain, uh, so it won't just be on neurodegeneration and those types of disease states, but uh, what can RG3 do for uh, minds in other ways, okay? The brain health in other ways. Like I said, it's been known in ancient Chinese medicine for centuries now of its various health benefits, primarily for endurance, memory, uh, and cognitive ability enhancement in that regard. Uh, and again, I, I mean, I don't mean to be redundant, but um, we weren't able to really quantify it as much until these last few you know, decades, right? Really getting it put down thanks to microbiologists and biochemists, uh, et cetera. Well, the hippocampus is the primary area of the brain that is responsible for memory recall and learning abilities. And um, there's been a few studies now. They, they were done with uh, lab uh, mice, um, running them through different puzzles and whatnot. But uh, what they did and what they found was they were able to enhance uh, their problem-solving capabilities and their memory recall through using uh, ginseng. In this case, it was somewhat the penexidyl ginsenoside RG3, but there was a little bit of RG1. Um, so there's different spectra of the ginseng, uh, different, uh, like I said, those were defense mechanisms of ginseng initially. So there's different, again, spectra of it, and certain ones can do th certain things. Um, RG3 certainly does help with this, but um, it can help with... Uh, cognitive function, memory recall, and problem solving. So you have uh, a byproduct of a plant. If you steam red ginseng and use it, for instance, we offer it here, we have this, which is excellent. Uh, we offer it as a nasal spray. Um, this can help prevent neurodegeneration. It can help to some degree rescue neurons that are in later stages of neurodegenerative disease states. Uh, it can also improve for anyone problem solving, cognitive ability, and memory recall. Um, isn't the natural world wonderful once you just, I mean, you, you can look at the nature and it has so much to offer and, it, you know, whether you dry this or distill that or eat this, I, I feel like so much of our problems are found around us in the natural world and I'm just happy to promote, again, something that is uh, natural and extremely beneficial to your brain health. Feel free to call us or email or make comments on the video, however you'd like to get a hold of us if you would like to try this penexidyl ginsenoside. The class, uh, the family is ginsenosides, uh, penexidyl, panex ginseng, red ginseng. So again, we have it, we offer it, we've dispensed it uh, multiple times to many different patients, um, wonderful effects. Uh, if you would like to learn more, feel free to reach out to us, okay? And thank you for watching. Take care.